So good morning, everyone. I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library. I think I know everyone who's in the session today live. And um, if you're watching the recording, I hope you are going to enjoy learning a little bit about disaster preparedness over the next hour. And I will be um, kind of guiding you through this. This is kind of my interest in bringing disaster preparedness training to libraries stems in part from my volunteer firefighting. Um, I, I was a member of the volunteer fire department here in East Glacier Park for 10 years. And I also served um, seven of those years as a uh, um, EMT with the Glacier County EMS. So I managed to get quite a bit of extra training in disaster preparedness in those roles, but also the library supported me in, in attaining additional training that was really directed at cultural institutions for disaster planning as well. So that's my background. Um, I grew up in a firefighting family. My dad was a volunteer firefighter. And so we kind of grew up, I kind of grew up with that um, kind of sensibility and orientation and we actually we did fire drills at home i hope you do fire drills and so it's always been my kind of um orientation to be prepared for things so that's what we're going to talk about today preparedness so as i can figure out how to get my slides to move on there we go too many windows open this morning so today we're going to take account of what we've learned from COVID because COVID is a was a disaster. I mean, maybe it still is. We're living through one of the longest disaster um, time periods in, in my lifetime. And 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 much of what we learned as COVID first hit <clears throat> now almost two years ago, you'll remember in March of 2020 when many libraries had to shut down, when we suddenly kind of went into um, almost hiding in our homes because we weren't sure how dangerous this disease was going to be and, and what its impacts were going to be. And now as we sit today, um, the United States as of today has crossed the threshold, a nasty threshold of 800,000 um, Americans dying of COVID. This is a time to take stock of what we've learned from this experience so that we're better prepared and can apply it to other disasters. We're going to talk about likely disasters that can impact library services in Montana. So we're going to kind of focus this on the kinds of experiences we have in our state and, and the kind of risks that, that we have here. And we're going to reconsider the role of library in response and recovery um, to a disaster. Libraries do have a role to play in assisting communities in so they in either in planning and planning for their resiliency and in the recovery effort and even um, in the initial response time, um, depending on the disaster and depending on your capacity and your community. We're going to take a little bit of time to assess preparedness. So I want you to be taking notes as you go along, as you think of things that you want to follow up with at your library that you can do right away to improve your preparedness. Please do that. And we want to take specific steps from what we know to be better prepared from response to recovery. So we're going to talk a little bit all, all the way through this. Just 20 slides today, but I'm happy to list, hear from all of you about your experiences and Hopefully, we'll also be able to learn from each other. So I thought I'd start with this picture from the CDC of a scientist looking at a bunch of samples in a tray. And just to remind all of us that we are living in a disaster at the moment. Um, this, is, this pandemic is a type of natural disaster, and we've all experienced it. I, in fact, when I, when I was teaching, taking an advanced disaster preparation course from um, Mon the state of Montana, the Department of Public Health and Human Services offers a, a weekend long um, training and they bring in several experts for EMTs and, and um, law enforcement volunteer firefighters. And 
they basically they told us that a pandemic this was years ago when i took this class they said a pandemic is the most likely large scale disaster that we would experience in our lifetime which of course turned out to be pretty prophetic and um and they also told us that the most dangerous part of a pandemic often is the public response to the public to that pandemic the there's a um, great danger of civil unrest, and we've all experienced a little of that as well. So going according to form, this pandemic, unfortunately, <clears throat> Montana, you know, is, is in a unique position because we are pretty rural, but we also have limited and distant um, hospital services. So we're both at risk, larger risk in a pandemic, and um, for some Montana residents, uh, greater protection from pandemic. You might also think about um, our risk for bioterrorism. We are at the headwaters of much of the nation's surface water, being the headwaters of the Missouri River. So we are at risk of a bioterrorism attack. We also have a lot of other risks, which we're going to talk about. So I'm going to kind of spend a little time um, making you panic. Also, yeah, um, Mitch is pointing out in the in the chat box that we have a research facility in Western Montana down near Missoula, actually south of Missoula, that is a, um, a world-class uh, medical research facility. And they handle all kinds of really nasty um, biological material and and they are at a risk as well. So that's the Rocky Mountain Labs. They do terrific work there. But it does present some risk to the to the community here. They could they could be attacked. And of course there's always the danger of um, bad materials getting into the out out of that facility and into the public, although that is a frankly very, very small risk. So earthquakes. So here is a map of Yellowstone National Park. That big blob in the middle is the Yellowstone caldera. That is the remains of the last large eruption that made Yellowstone National Park into what it looks like today. Uh, you can see the blue area here is Yellowstone Lake. That's the West Thumb Geyser Basin here. All of these dots are um, earthquake activity from the year 2017 when there was a pretty active swarm of earthquakes. This is not unusual in Yellowstone. Um, most every year will look something like this. These are all, as you can see, relatively minor earthquakes, less than um, three on the Richter scale, most of them. Uh, none actually that I can see that are other up to less than, uh, you know, between three and four. They're almost all below three. So um, would cause a little shaking if you're nearby, but not a big deal, but the number of them is interesting. And you see all this little swarm up here by West Yellowstone. Um, that's uh, kind of interesting. I, I mean, geologists are always trying to figure out what's going on in Yellowstone National Park. And of course, we've all heard about the super volcano and the fact that it does erupt um, every violently um, every 600,000 years or so. And it's um, been almost 600,000 years since it last erupted. So, but earthquakes are a concern all over Montana. Actually, there are fault lines all along the Rocky Mountain front and out into the plains as well. So um, the chance of us experiencing an earthquake that um, is quite devastating in Montana is very real. Um, I will point out that over in this neighborhood up here, is where Hebkin Lake is an earthquake lake at the um, also at along the Madison River just between West Yellowstone and Ennis, Montana in 1959 an earthquake there um, literally dropped half a mountain onto a campground in the middle of the night um, well not in the middle but late in the evening and it was probably a um, 
it, it completely cut off um, those communities and people who were vacationing and living in that area for several days. 27 lives were lost in landslide. Many of those um, uh, bodies were never recovered. And it's if you ever go north to up into Canada, across Crow's Nest Pass, um, you can visit the Turtle Mountain area and the uh, visitor center there to see a slide that happened um, near that mountain in 1903. 90 lives lost when half, a big chunk of the mountain rolled down and into town. So there's all these risks of earthquake that we're surrounded with. And even though I don't think anybody loses too much sleep about, about living in an earthquake area, I will ask you um, today when you go home to just look around your house at um, maybe a large, if you have a large poster that's hanging somewhere that has glass on it, make sure it's not hanging right above your bed. Okay, and maybe make a few changes or, or notice in your house things that could easily topple over and hurt someone um, while they were sleeping. Maybe make a little change there. And that's also true in your library, too. Those big, tall bookcase living in a very active earthquake area and having big, tall bookcases in your library that may not be secured well to a wall or, or anchored might be something you, you'd think about. Have any of you ever experienced an earthquake? Yes, when I lived in California. I'll bet most of you have experienced a fire or near a fire. And um, this particular map is, is from July 2021, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric um, Association, association, that's not the right word. But anyway, NOAA um, created this map that, that lists the risk of an increased or longer wildfire, wildfire season across the United States by the mid-century. So by 2050, look at Montana. This really struck me. There's almost no place in Montana that is not at risk for extending the fire season. So where um, perhaps you may have experienced if you've lived in Montana for a while that, you know, fire season was generally something that starts in July and we all look forward to the end of fire season sometime in September or October when the snow starts to fall. But as we all know, the, um, we, have, we have devastating wildfires in this state in the, in the winter. Um, depending on what the snow cover is, especially out in the prairies. And so there's, there's quite a bit of risk there. Uh, so we're hearing from the chat room that there are frequent rumbles in West Yellowstone, right? Michelle is our resident West Yellowstone expert. And as we were looking at that map earlier, we could see there's lots of little uh, smaller earthquakes happening around West Yellowstone all the time. And then Cindy Thomas out in Plains is saying there was a slight earthquake there in early 2020. So not an unusual experience in Montana. But talking about the back to the fires, we all remember um, that just a few days ago, actually, there was this fire in Denton, Montana. This is from a photo that the Sheriff's Office took with a drone that shows, I think it's a drone, it might have been a helicopter, that shows the path of the fire. This over here, the smoking areas where um, they had several grain silos that caught on fire, were not able to be saved. Luckily, um, this entire town was had to be evacuated in, in very short order when a wild Land, a rangeland fire just took off and high winds just barreled it toward town. Luckily, local firefighters were able to get a lot of things wetted down in town. So the fire kind of went around the outskirts of the town. That arrow here is pointing toward the location of the public library in Denton, Montana. But as you, there's quite a bit of um, loss. There were several buildings and um, and look at how close the wildfire came over here, just within a few yards of many of these downtown buildings. So we're all living with um, with the 
disaster of fire kind of on our doorstep in Montana. That's something we all have to be prepared about. And then if you think that's one another thing you could maybe make a note of today is just at your library, could you have another outdoor spigot um, that you can use to wet down the area around your library? Is there anything you can do to make the building more fire resistant? Um, talking about other kinds of hazards in Montana. We have an extensive uh, rail system in Montana for freight traffic, which includes a lot of hazardous materials. So we did have an um, Amtrak derailment recently in Montana. You'll, you'll remember hearing about that. <clears throat> but at least in this, where there was loss of life with that derailment. There were several people injured. There were um, ambulance services from three counties away that got called in to help transport um, injured passengers away from that scene. So it was a very big operation because there were so many uh, injured. But compared to a derailment where a hazardous material was released, um, it's, you know, those are really dangerous and, and, they're, and they're not infrequent in their occurrence across the country. We've been kind of lucky here in Montana that we haven't had a really big um, commercial spill from, a, from air, rail traffic. <clears throat> we also have a lot of pipelines in Montana too. I just wanna point out that this is just a photo of what happened in 2013 in Lac Megantic, which is a little town, not a little town, it's a good sized tourist town along a lake in Quebec. And, um, a, a bunch of rail cars, these are all rail cars, these little tubes here that were con that contained crude oil. And through a mistake, a human error, the, the brakes for this train weren't set properly overnight. And as the hydraulic brakes um, failed, when after the engine was shut down, the crew had to rest for the evening. So they stopped the train and the hydraulic brakes were set and the mechanical brakes were not set sufficiently to prevent the train from rolling back down the hill, coming into town, derailing and then exploding. And so this is what their downtown looked like the next day. And when you think about all of the crew oil trains that come through Montana um, that you've seen along the tracks in your travels. Um, any this a tourist town like mine, for instance, I it's rare for a day to go by that I don't see a crude oil train um, come through here. It's usually more like two or three. So these kinds of um, events are devastating. Uh, I'm trying to think how many people were died. 47 people died. Um, in this in this rail accident a lot of them were at a right in the when that explosion happened so this might be something you don't think about very often this is um the uh, a map that shows the range of uh, area that can be affected by an electromagnetic pulse. This would be perpetrated by an enemy to the United States and from space, actually. So the U.S., these, this is what, this um, electromagnetic pulses can disrupt power. And so if a device is detonated over the country, it can completely disrupt the power grid across the entire country. Now, you'll remember in Texas, um, a strain on the power grid caused by storms in Texas um, resulted in homes being dark for weeks. We all have experienced here in Montana when the power goes out for a few hours, you know, we always have prepared. Um, a lot of people in Montana do have generators. You have other ways to create power. I don't know if you have a generator for your library, but you might want to think about that. Um, so that you can be a place that people can go to to get warm when the power is out. But in the case of an attack by an enemy to the United States with electromagnetic pulse, there's a great risk um, 
to all of us for that from that. And I just want to point out this book, if you really want to um, kind of feel depressed, <laughs> don't read this in the middle of the winter, but um, Ted Koppel wrote this book. He's a, um, a, a journalist and had been um, a news anchor for one of the major networks. I want to say be 100% sure about that. Um, he, he, he was alarmed by what he was learning about how vulnerable our electrical grid is and wrote this very short book, very well-researched book about um, how very unprepared we are as a country to survive the aftermath of a large-scale cyber attack on our electrical grid. So um, maybe some uh, summertime reading for you here, light reading. Uh, so what's a library to do? Here's some photos of libraries doing stuff. Um, and and I, I want to use the chat for a moment, or you can just unmute your microphone to suggest what your library could be doing to help a community, your community, during a disaster. And these, here's some ideas for you in the pictures here. And think about the pandemic as an example. What did your library do to help out during the pandemic? So take a moment, post something in the chat box. If, you, if it's not something you can think of, maybe, maybe something you could have done. Ah, Kathleen says, we did a lot of cleaning and disinfecting. You reacted by keeping your library open and making services available, but instituting new procedures to do that, right? Mitch says it okay? they closed the public to prevent um, to prevent the spread of the pandemic disease. Michelle yeah. said we clean. We did a lot of repairs during the pandemic. Did any of you start up, as some libraries did, um, alternate services like um, curbside service for pickups? One of the things we did was expand the collection of Montana Library to Go. Um, yep, Mitch is saying in Lewis, in um, Livingston that they did um, start up new services. Kathleen and Belgrade said they offered curbside. They were never without some level of service to the public. So and in West Yellowstone, curbside and home delivery of books. Um, a lot of libraries that in our very rural areas did remain open. They had relatively low risk. So um, that's what this picture down here is uh, of a piece of plexiglass that's been um, uh, added to the library circula circulation desk to keep people safe. And um, Melody is pointing out she knows of libraries that created oral histories and recorded local experiences through the pandemic. So that local experience isn't lost. And thanks for pointing that out. Up here in the upper right left hand corner is a special collections um, uh, area of a, of a local library. And, um, and that's exactly what I was trying to think of there was that this is an opportunity to, uh, to take record this event, this really watershed event that we're living through. Um, in the lower left is the state library staff at a Zoom meeting. And I, I want to point out that we figured out ways to, to keep meeting and keep training. I a lot of librarians who took the opportunity when the library was either closed or services hours were reduced to catch up on their professional development. So libraries did step up. Um, libraries provided information um, during the pandemic and um, some libraries were distribution centers for um, masks and 
and uh, materials for that information about how to keep safe. So these are some of the things we do. Now think about something like a, a fire um, going, uh, going on near a community. I know of libraries that during um, a, when an evacuation was occurring, in one near their community that they opened up the library as a place for people to go to temporarily shelter or to recharge their phones or to get information. I've driven by libraries where the um, uh, local fire response team has posted bulletin at the library because that's a good place. People go there for information. Um, libraries uh, during a storm can be open uh, to, so people can shelter in the library temporarily or recharge their phones or devices. People who have medical conditions that require electricity for a device that keeps them alive might need um, uh, just to go to the library to turn on their, uh, to plug in their their equipment and, um, and give themselves a treatment. So there's all kinds of, uh, things that libraries can do to help communities during and after and before, before, during, and after a disaster. So now you get the chance to take a test. I'm not going to ask you for how you scored, um, although you can always volunteer that information. So let's go through this real quick. Um, take a note, you can use your fingers. It's 10, 10 questions, so you don't need to get any paper out to keep track, but give yourself one point for each one that you um, can say your library is prepared to do this. So do you have a collection of useful print materials available in the event of a long-term power outage in your community? That's a point. Do you maintain a response station? Do you have a first aid kit, flashlights? maybe a bullhorn, a couple bottles of water, space blanket, snacks. Are you, in the case of a disaster, if it hits right now, are you, do you have a, a place in your library where you have things collected and everybody knows where that is? Maybe it's a backpack full of stuff. Um, if you have to get out of the building, but you want to be able to take your um, a basic first aid kit and some water and some snacks with you as you head out the door because you may not be able to get home. Um, is that ready? Do you, have you thought about, here's number three, have you thought about your communication strategy? So in the case of a disaster, you, you have someone who's appointed to um, provide information and get information but does it also include someone who's talking on social media? One of the things that happens during a disaster is a lot of misinformation and confusion. It's for libraries, social media page is really important during a disaster. If you get qualified vetted information, you should share it. Um, give yourself a point if you have, if you have, if you're active in social media and you have someone appointed to be um, sharing information during a disaster. Um, give yourself a point if you've performed at least one drill in the past year for unplanned incidents or a tabletop exercise. I'm actually going to give you a couple uh, sample tabletop exercises. That's when you just sit around a table and you discuss a disaster and you just kind of talk your way through it. It doesn't involve actually getting up and moving or, or acting anything out like a drill. Um, so give yourself a point if you've performed, if, if in the past five years, you've discussed salvage and recovery issues with a preservationist or salvage company, and there's three of them listed here. Um, have you been in contact with them and just said, so I just want to talk to you, how do I reach you in the case of a disaster? Maybe you have their phone number in your, um, built into your smartphone, or you have that written down somewhere, or contact information. Um, if you've done that, give yourself a point. How about, have you met with emergency responders in the last couple of years to review your response procedures? This could be your local Department of Emergency Services. That would be a county level position, or if you're um, on or near a reservation, there's a tribal DES person. 
Um, have you met, met, met with them? Have they walked through your library and discussed shelter in place locations in your library? If a person comes into your library, um, you know, an active shooter thing, do you, do you, have you discussed with police how you'll respond? Any of those really count for that point. And if you have, if you're up to number seven now, do you have a disaster team ready to keep your core services available? One thing we've learned from the pandemic is you probably do need a team so that when something like this happens, um, there's it's not just the director that's authorized to know what to do because you might need more than the director might not be available. The director could be impacted by the disaster or just you know, away on vacation in Fiji or something. So um, always good to have a, a team ready to keep your core services available. I have to tell you, my library, the state library, doesn't score all that well on this test. Just to let you know, um, we depend a lot on the state to do a lot of this stuff for us. But anyway, up to number eight, your staff is aware of the importance of home preparedness. This is one that we can get done today. You can share this video with this, the video of this training with them. You can ask them to take the time they need to um, plan an exit strategy. And if nothing else, um, and this is my old fire department days, have an agreement with everybody in your household on where you're going to meet up if you ever have to evacuate your house in a hurry. So during a fire, middle of the night, you all have to get out of the house, have an agreement of where you're gonna meet up. Um, and that's the very least you can do. And um, it's coming up to the end of the year and that's a good time to check the batteries in your smoke detectors too. So are you familiar with the Stafford Act? The Stafford Act is funding for libraries to relocate for their services after a disaster, immediately following a disaster. So you can, if you have a, an alternate location for library services and activities, you can apply for federal money through FEMA that will um, cover those additional costs. You will not have to assume those costs. And so reading and learning a little bit about the Stafford Ask, Act as a way of um, preparing is, is worth a point. And have you ever talked with another library, maybe one town over, about um, how you could work together in a, in a disaster to help each other out? That would get you a 10th point. So those are just some of the things you can do to be prepared. And these slides, by the way, are going to be posted. Um, they are posted already in our Moodle course that I've set up um, to support disaster preparedness. So here are some things that your library could do to help in a response. You could be your town's charging station. So do you have um, a few extra or can you get your hands on a few extra um, power strips to use in the case of an emergency so you can set up um, charging stations? These are really useful for first responders. You know, a lot of time in a disaster, first responders are depending on their phones to communicate. And so the, knowing that you have the capacity to surge up and charge 30 or 40 phones all at once, it could be very, very useful in the immediate um, response during a disaster. You could be a meeting place for emergency planners or responders so that they can um, safely leave stuff or maybe that's their, becomes their check-in place for, for the... Uh, um, you can help your community become more disaster literate. You can work with your um, public health department on projects such as helping to improve disaster literacy in your community, helping them know where to go to get information, helping them to squash misinformation um, and helping them to understand, helping your community to understand that during a disaster, it's really important to remain calm and go to valid resources to find information, not just Facebook. 
And then you could be the point of coordination. Following a disaster, the library could be designated as a space for actions such as coordinating disaster volunteers or reunification. Reuniting families is a big step in disaster uh, response and recovery. Um, people get separated during a disaster, during uh, the Katrina uh, hurricane and flood that disrupted much of, of New Orleans. Their families were evacuated from the flooding, flooded areas and sent to states far away. And sometimes families were, were separated in that process to states far away. There's a story of one child who was two years old, who was not with their family at the time that the, of the disaster, got sent to someplace in Georgia. The parents got sent, sent to someplace in Texas and the, the child was not old enough to communicate um, adequately and the parents thought their child was um, deceased. They were not able to find them. And it was literally months, nearly a year before they were reunited. Um, reunification is a specific process that uh, the Red Cross usually ma um, manages. But in, in small communities like Montana, it probably not be in charge of reunification. So getting parents and their kids, the caregivers and their kids back together is, is something that libraries could, could be a really appropriate play, place to play to, to contribute to that role. Um, you can be a, a site for distributing water, or clothing, food, um, a warming and cooling site. Somebody mentioned that they've been opened up the library to be a warming site during the disaster, just flexing your hours during a fire. You could be a cooling area for people who have lost power and are um, just plain old hot. Maybe your first responders need a place to cool down and you've got air conditioning. You're, you're a great resource. You're obviously the education site in your community. So it's great that you can um, provide access. You can get people in, you know people in the community might be able to help out with something. You're a great place for people to go and get information. And of course you really provide a sense of normalcy. So your community really views you as a place of solace and sanity. <laughs> So that's, that's a real strength we have. Um, you are a point of distribution in the event for mass inoculations. I mean, I don't know, none of you have, um, that didn't really happen with the pandemic and um, that, that the process of rolling out inoculations was very measured and um, over time. And uh, there was not a need to do mass inoculations in a big hurry, like there would be if there was um, a bioterrorism attack using a, a, some kind of um, viral or bacterial stuff. Um, you could, this if you have a bookmobile or other vehicles, those could be used in put into use uh, to deliver materials out two people during a disaster as well. So you have a lot to, to give in a disaster. And all these ideas actually come from my colleague at the University of Virginia, um, Dan Wilson, who uh, has been really active nationwide promoting disaster preparedness and response with libraries. So one assignment after today, and make this your New Year's resolution, perhaps, if you haven't done it more recently, reach out to your Department of Emergency Services in your county or tribe. Um, let them know that you have all of these, uh, all of this capacity. You may already be written into your county's emergency response plan. A lot of times the DES person has already written the library into a role and they just haven't gotten around to telling you about it. So go ahead and just invite them over, um, have a cup of coffee, uh, bring them some cookies and, um, and have a discussion about what the library can, can do during a disaster and how you might be able to help the community be better prepared. So this is the disaster process or wheel. Um, 
and it is it is a circle because we're right now we're talking about preparedness being prepared when a disaster happens you immediately launch into responding the response is often oh the pandemic it's like the response has been going on for two years but most disasters have a finite response time for a fire it could be several weeks um, for an earthquake it could be um, a couple of weeks or a couple of days a flash flood maybe just a couple hours um, and then you this longer period of recovery often happens where the community is now kind of mopping up and trying to figure out how to rebuild um, uh, clean up uh, reduce um, the effects and then mitigation is how to kind of out of recovery um, repair things. Maybe you don't build back in the same spot that the flash flood took out that building. And so you're, you're kind of recreating your community to be more resilient in the future. And that immediately leads into more preparedness. So this is FEMA's graphic. And then this is your other assignment for, and for 2022. Um, 2022 uh, is to get a um, emergency response plan. I have a template for this little um, piece of paper. It's a it's a it's a regular old piece of paper with a lot of information on it. And these vertical lines allow you to fold it up accordion style. Um, there's there's information on the front and back. So if you fold it up accordion accordion style, then you can fold it into threes and it will come out being just about a little bit smaller than, here's a post-it note. It actually comes out about this size, uh, the size of a credit card, and it fits into your wallet. So the idea of this pocket response plan, and this was um, really created, this idea was created by the Council of State Archivists, is to have all the information anyone needs in your library for almost any emergency. Over here, all different types of emergencies likely to happen and the response procedures for those. Here's all the information about who in on your disaster response team. It could be library members, it could be um, board members, it could be other contacts in the community. Uh, the, here's your communications plan. On the back of this, there's um, there's a list of how you're going to find out, you know, who's who's expected to be in the library that day. If your library suddenly collapses, as the candle factory in Mayfield, Kentucky, did a few days ago, how do you know who was in supposed to be in that building at the time that that happened? So, all kinds of information that you can put into this um, one-page template disaster page, disaster plan that folds up and fits into your wallet. The reason you want it in your wallet is you need it to be with you at all times because you don't know when a dis this is a weird thing about disasters. They're not planned. They happen when you least expect them. And so I have had one director who told me he pulled out his plan on a Sunday because suddenly he needed to close the library. This was leading up into COVID and his city disaster, um, his DES people called and said, you know, you can't open the library. No, no public offices are going to open tomorrow. And it was a Sunday and the library usually wasn't open on Sunday. And so he wasn't allowed to go into his building to get any information. And he pulled out his, his plan and he, all of the information was there that he needed to to contact security, to get um, uh, the staff contact someone. He had a, a contact number for to get the staff notified the next day. I uh, was able to get somebody to go put a sign up on the door, and he wasn't even able to do any of these things himself. But he, but the his little this little pocket protection pocket, um, I would say pocket protector, pocket pr plan was put into action. So this is what the back of it looks like. There's a little, um, uh, you want a little like floor plan for your library. So you can also tell first responders, say you have a flash flood 
you want to tell first responders where there are materials inside the library or pending, like the Denton Public Library, you have to evacuate, but you'd like the first responders to know that over here is a special collection of resources that can never be replaced. So if they have time to go into the library to recover some things, you can point them directly to where they need to go. So just thinking about things. Oh, by the way, more information about the Stafford Act over here, some relocation ideas. All of this is just a template. You'll um, customize this to your local situation. I have the job of updating the state libraries before I retire in a couple of weeks. So, and this is my really fun announcement. We have used some of our additional funding from the um, ARPA, ARPA um, Act. Actually, that's I'm I'm saying Act twice. The, the Recovery Act to purchase first aid kits, care organizations requiring all the materials for you. There will be a first aid, uh, pretty jazzed up first aid kit going to every public and tribal library in Montana in the spring. So she is uh, or busy ordering materials right now. And these will be coming with um, uh, appropriate personal protective gear. You know, I actually took this photo of a first aid kit that I brought to an MLA conference a couple of years ago to show people what ought to be in your first aid kit. And now all this stuff looks so familiar. There's, this is a N95 mask over here, a, little, a paper mask. These are gloves, uh, um, non-latex nitrile gloves. This is a uh, pair of protective goggles. <laughs> all these things now, people been exposed to them from COVID. Uh, you know how to put on a mask now. And, um, so anyway, this particular first aid kit um, is very much specialized to uh, conditions in Montana. So we're going to um, be shipping these all out to you and you will have them. Uh, if you already have a first aid kit, now you'll have two, which is always better. So and here we are, uh, Melody, don't keep those super special items in the basement. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm talking about uh, the, um, your, your special collections. Yeah, the basement is the worst place. Any place that they're exposed to extra humidity is really a bad thing. Yeah, so great. Everybody else getting a nice first aid kit. So that's how one of the ways we're going to be using that extra funding we got this year. And those will be distributed at Federation meetings in the spring. So this is how you get started today. I know it's covered a lot of information, but form an emergency preparedness team, reach out to your emergency planners, complete a one page disaster plan, um, hopefully the one that folds up and support a culture of preparedness. Oh, one more thing to do right now, get out your phone and don't play Christmas music, Joe. Go ahead and download the FEMA app. There it is. So download the FEMA app. Just go to your um, Google Play or App Store and it'll look like this. And you can go ahead and over here on the alerts button, you can put in the communities you want to be um, advised on. If you have a family member somewhere and you want to get FEMA's um, emergency alerts for that area, you can put almost any number of, of locations in your alert file. By the way, I'm currently under a winter weather advisory here at home. So that's the FEMA app. You're going to do that like right now. Okay, everybody doing that? Hopefully. Okay, so next I'm going to show you while we're at answering questions and bring up um, Maybe we have, oh, we have a Moodle space at the State Library now. And let me just bring that up. Oh, that's silly. And so I've created a space for it to sort of house all of this information. Let me show you what that looks like. Da, da, da. Let me make sure I'll have to stop sharing that and start sharing. 
this, yeah. So I will be uploading the recording from today and the slides are already in our little Moodle space. I have resources for you here, uh, information, this is the link for how to apply for assistance following the disaster. So if your library is impacted by a disaster, you can get federal assistance to recover. Um, I have created two scenarios, these several years ago actually, that you can work with your staff or just volunteers and um, kind of work through and talk about and practice how you would respond to a to a scenario. This one, the D disaster response resources page is um, already posted um, in Aspen as well. So for today's events, but here, and then this is the template for the pocket disaster plan. Right here, you can download that. This is a list of all the stuff that's in the first aid kit. You can download that. Actually, I have that list here somewhere too. And then um, the uh, this material recovery kit. Um, we are also developing. Um, Kara is putting together a large tote. Probably, it's going to end up being two totes of materials that we're going to place. One of these at each at a library in each federation in Montana, and these are full of material of resources for document recovery. So it helped blotter paper, um, a bunch of uh, um, just clothespins, things to help if you have if a library does suffer water damage, primarily water damage, and and you just need a lot of materials um, quickly to to help dry things out. And so we're putting together two totes full of these materials that we're going to place around the state. So you'll have the one that's closest to you right away. And if you need more, you can call the kit from the Federation next door. So do you have any questions or comments? What do we do in case of an You didn't help me. I have a question. What do, we do, is, um, do you all know how to get into the Moodle? Cindy, oh, sorry, sorry, you're not on mute. You all know how to get into the Moodle um, source, the Moodle space that we have, the State Library? Yeah. This is the handout I have that's in. Um, that's posted in Aspen and also on our Moodle space. So um, if you go to, and I'll put this in the chat box, and if you're watching the recording, it's, it'll be in the description. If you go to Mon MT State Library, dot Moonami, that's M O O N A M I dot com, that's the link to our. Just, just a second, I need to. Make sure everybody in the gets this link. So that's mtstatelibrary.moonami.com. That will take you to the state library's Moodle page that looks like this. Now you'll have to create a login. You can create your very own login to get in there and then you'll see this. And here's the disaster preparedness for Montana libraries. And in order to get to this page, you'll actually need to use a pass key. And the pass key is be prepared. No, be ready, sorry. Be ready. And with the capital B and capital R, all in word, be ready. Or you can just ask me and I'll enroll you once you have set up your, um, your login. And that way these resources will be available to you anytime, any place. And that is the end of my show. Ta -da. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording and I will stick around and we can have a little more discussion and, and questions. So thank you. Okay.